Hey, welcome back to the MHP show with another episode where we talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, how to acquire, how to underwrite, how to look at, how to find, whatever. We talk about anything and everything, mobile home parks. I'm your host, Derek Vickers. I'm the CEO of Victory Real Estate Group. We own and operate uh, 38 mobile home parks in the Southeast. And I'm here with another episode for you today. It should be a lot of fun and very informative. Look, if you haven't yet, please like and subscribe to the podcast. I would very, very, very much appreciate that. As uh, you know, it's not as easy to run a podcast as you think. You have to, there's a lot that goes into it. And eventually I'll start having some uh, guests come on the show. But anyways, it's, it's a lot of fun and I love giving value to people. And I've gotten text messages from people and saying they love the podcast. So again, look, if there's any ideas that you have, anything you want me to talk about, anything that that you think would be a good topic for the podcast, I would love to, would love to hear that. So this week, we're going to talk about something and the thing that everyone you know, hates and loves at the, at the same time. We're going to talk about acquisitions. We're going to talk about different strategies around acquisitions of mobile home parks. And of course, you know, I'm going to give some, give some insight at things that I've done that um, has helped. And is there one acquisition strategy that trumps the other? Maybe, but you have to use all of them. And because I'm a believer, a law that basically states that the more you outflow, the more calls you put out, the more communication you send out endeavors towards a goal, the more effort you send out to something, the more you're going to get in return. And you always get a little bit more less in return than you put out in the beginning because it's sort of like a, it's like a reverse effect. Okay. And you have to really, 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 really dump in first before you start getting stuff out of it. And so I would tell you to use all of these things that I'm going to tell you. Okay. And all these things you've probably heard of before, but I'm going to relate these to instances that I've had and instances of me using these and they, they've worked and, and not worked. So the first way, and it is our favorite way, is cold calling direct to seller. Cold calling direct to seller. Now, I was in the insurance business before, so this is all I freaking did. I walked in the businesses cold calling. I walked in I walked in the places where they didn't want me. I got cursed out. I got told to get the F out of my office. I remember one time I literally walked into the door of a business and the guy's like, nope, 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 nope. Insurance guys, get the hell out of there. Because I was wearing a shirt with the name brand of the company that I worked for. And he basically told me just to get the hell out. And so then after you know a few years of doing that, I actually learned to use the phone and I could actually talk to more people you know, I can make 200 calls in a day versus you can only go into like 25, 30, 50 businesses a day. But going in person is more powerful. But direct to seller in mobile home parks is huge and it is important. And although that none of us like cold calling, and I wrote an article on Substack about this, is that this is the skill that you need to learn that you hate, that we all hate. If I see a park today that I want to, you know, that I'm like, man, love to own that park. Find their number, give them a call. Hey man, just drove through. Are you looking to sell? You have a plan to get out of it or whatever. That's still not the most comfortable call to make. There's always a little uncertainty there. And if anybody says, ah, oh, I don't care about making cold calls, maybe they don't, but I've never really, you know, there's always still something there, but I've just gotten in the habit of doing it anyway. And the price I have to pay to press the send button is much less than the price I'll have to pay later for regretting making the call. And then somebody posts on LinkedIn and says, oh my God, I just closed this deal. Or I hear from a broker that so-and-so closed on this freaking deal that I should have called on, but I wussed out and didn't make the call. All right. So cold calling is very, very, very important when you're looking for off-market deals because the on-market stuff, if you're looking on LoopNet and Corexy, nine times out of 10 is that these deals that hit that have already been sent through guys like me or other people in the industry 
and they've said no to it for whatever reason. So Corexi and LoopNet is actually the dumping ground for good deals. So going to direct to seller is going to be fantastically profitable for you if you have the persistence and if you have the willingness to do it on a daily basis. Now, when I was in the insurance business, I was taking every little second that I had to make cold calls to mobile home park owners. And actually, the second deal we found was through me cold calling. And this was in, I found this deal, it was probably, I want to say September, October of 2020. So the owner of this park, he, this was a 37 space park right outside of, well, it's an Orlando address, but it's really kind of outside of Orlando. And the owner, the owner lived in Illinois. He was in his seventies. He lived in Chicago, I believe. And he had invested in like hotels, multifamily and things. And he was selling all this assets. And I just happened to be there at the right place at the right time. And he liked me. We built rapport over many different back and forth calls. And he actually sold me this property for less than he paid for it. And so him and I really hit it off on the, on the phone and I just built a relationship with him. He, you know, he wasn't like this on the first call. The first call, he was a little, he was like, yeah, I'm trying to sell. But after a few weeks of talking to him and going back and forth and, and this and that, he actually opened up to me and was like, yeah, I need to get out. The property was making six grand a month. His manager was stealing from him. He never went there. He hadn't been there in a long time. And he ended up selling it to us for less than he actually paid for it, which is crazy. But you don't get that if you're not making the calls every day. Because if you make 100 calls, 95 of them aren't going to be good. The seller is going to give you a stupid number because they really don't want to sell or you know, you're not going to get anybody on the phone or whatnot, but that one that, and I think I was actually scared to call this guy for some reason. I'm like, oh my God, he's an owner. Cause on the list, it said he lived in Illinois. And I'm like, oh my God, the guy's going to be an asshole. And he really wasn't an ass. He was actually a really nice guy. So that's another thing when you're cold calling, all the preconceptions that you have that you think are going to happen are always wrong. So the call you're most reluctant to actually do is the one that will probably yield you the most results. Just remember that. And so by having the balls to make this call and call this guy, this park, we bought it for $1.1 million. It was 37 pads. So that was thirty mid-30s a pad, something like that. In Orlando, who would like to buy that now? Like, good luck. You're, you're not finding that. And so we actually refinanced this deal in at the beginning of 22. It reappraised for, I think, 90-something a pad. We crushed it on this deal. You know, it was a bunch of vacancy, and we actually filled it up and brought people in. And now it's a great park. Going back, that property reappraised for something to the effect of, uh, I don't know, three or four million, whatever it was. I'd have to look to get you the exact numbers. But three, four times what we paid for, millions of dollars of value created off of one phone call. So think about that. The call that you're hesitant to make, the one you're not making, could generate you millions and millions of dollars. So just remember that. So cold calling is important. And a good strategy for doing this is just blocking off time to do it. Get your list. If you don't have a list of mobile home parks to call, I'd love to help you do that. So just let me know. But you got to have that list and you have to sit down and do it. And the first one's going to be the hardest. And they make it a little easier as you go. And somebody might yell at you. Somebody might tell you to screw off. You're going to get punched in the face. You're not going to feel good. And especially if you have never made cold calls before, you're going to hate this. Because I had done it for eight or nine years, this was, I was like, shit, dude, this is the first time I've ever actually called someone and offered them money instead of trying to sell them some shit. So, but this is how you're going to find your deals. You know, you look on LinkedIn, you hear people, man, I found this great deal. And you're like, man, how the hell did he find that? I guarantee you most of the time it was because they were cold calling and they found this off-market deal, built a great relationship with the seller, okay? 
So there's really no cons to cold calling. Just your ego might get hit a little bit. And there's nothing wrong with that. Take some punches in the face, develop some, some thick skin, and you're going to do well at this. And so another tip where I found success in cold calling. Now, if you live in Georgia and you're calling parks in Nebraska, maybe a little bit more difficult to do this. So I was calling parks in Florida. So I was driving all these parks, driving them, getting a feel for them. Okay, I like this one. I don't like this one. So I would generally call and say, hey, is this John Smith seller? Yeah, this is him. Hey, this is Derek Vickers. I was uh, driving through your park and um, you know, you've done a really great job with it. I just don't understand how you've been able to do X, Y, and Z. And then that would really sometimes spark a conversation with them. So I would always find some commonality with them instead of just calling, hey, John, this is uh, Derek. Hey, are you trying to sell? That's just like, I've had people call me and basically do that. And I'm like, no, screw you, dude. And so getting on common ground is, is important. And then, you know, I would talk to them for a little bit, learn a little bit more about the property and be like, hey, you ever actually, you know, thought, I'm surprised you're not getting a ton of calls asking you to sell. Have you entertained any offer? And so you're differentiating yourself a bit by getting into communication with them. Now, I will say this on the other end of that, there's some people that don't even want to talk, but you'll be able to tell that if you try to get on common ground and talk to them you'll get the picture pretty quick that they don't want to talk to you and you just got to sense that and you know you can get off the phone maybe you call them back at a different time on the other end of that Johnny may talk to you for 2 hours okay and that is good but you want to stop that to a certain degree cuz it can waste a lot of your time but if it's a really good deal you can probably do it and, and make it work but i would always say too is that one the tip of getting on common ground but also following up with them don't just call them once and don't follow up. There was a deal that I was looking at in Tampa. I'd actually went there in person one time and the guy was like, no way, no chance in hell. We're not effing selling. And I took that as gospel, which was wrong, by the way. And for some reason, I was apprehensive to calling this guy back. And then when I finally freaking called him back, He's like, I think I called him back after a hurricane that we had in Florida because this was a way for me to follow up with him, which you should use things like that to follow up with sellers you're working on. He's like, yeah, you know, everything's fine because of the hurricane, but we sold last month. And I'm like, mm, 275 space park in the middle of Tampa, pretty good freaking deal. And maybe we, he wouldn't have sold. We probably wouldn't have paid the number that he got. But still, you want to be first in these sellers' minds. Like when Johnny decides to sell, you want him to be like, I'm calling you because he knows you're interested. You've built rapport with him. He trusts you. That is important, but you always want to leave these calls with a means of follow-up. And you want to get creative with the follow-up. I use the hurricane or you can call, hey, you know, I uh, just worked with this great electrician at one of our properties. I just worked with this great plumber. Here's his number. You may want to use him the next time you have an issue. Or this guy really helped me solve this septic or well issue we had or whatever. You know, there's an infinite number of, of possibilities for you to follow up with these people. Okay, so cold calling, you want to build rapport, get on common ground. You want to find ways to follow up and continue to follow up. And if you're in the area you can, you know, schedule a lunch with them or, or whatever. So I'm going to go deeper into cold calling. I could probably do a whole freaking episode on cold calling, but that is one of the ways we're just generally talking about acquisitions here. Now, another way is direct to seller uh, referrals. Okay. So all that stuff I just talked about when you're talking to these sellers, maybe they tell you, ah, oh, you know, I'm not looking to sell now. And we're like, okay, great. Well, who else do you know in the area that has a mobile home park, you know, that may be considering selling now or in the future or anybody I could talk to and pick their brain? I'm still learning and, and trying to understand this business a little bit more. Because typically, the mom and pop owner of the mobile home park knows other mobile home park owners in the area and not the institutional owners. They know the other mom and pop owners personally because they all talk to each other. We actually got a fantastic deal 
because we purchased a park from a guy who I cold called um, and had talked to for a while. And then when we closed with him, he called me. I asked him and I was like, hey, you know anybody else that's looking to sell? He's like, yeah, you need to call my friend Mike down the road here. And it was a 72 space park. And we ended up closing on that too. And this was the easiest park to get under contract because I sent the offer in. The Bob, the other guy that we bought from, told Mike that basically, hey, we were good. We'll close. You know, we're going to close fast. We're not going to cause any problems. We're going to do what we say we're going to do. And I think that had something to do with me sending them the contract at nine o'clock on maybe it was a Tuesday or whatever, me getting it back signed the next morning, which I just never really had that happen before. It's always some some back and forth and, and whatnot. So getting referrals from the people you're talking to on the phone or even parks that you've closed before is a great strategy. And I've always been told this in, in sales is that getting referrals, and that's important because I guarantee you that mom and pop mobile home park owner knows the other owners. It's a small industry and they know them. And so you build rapport with them. They like you. They can give you names to, to other people in the area. So referrals. Now, the next one I'm going to talk to about is, is mailers. So I'm going to be honest with you. We get mailers all of the time. From, you know, somebody that's got his picture with his dog on the front or somebody's got a picture of his wife and kids on the front. You know, they're fine. So, again, revert back to what I said in the beginning. More outflow equals more inflow. And I've actually never, we've never done mailers for whatever reason. We've always had good deal flow because we've worked these other avenues. But I know that mailers work. It's not very cost effective, I don't think, and your response rate isn't that high, but it is another means of getting stuff out. And if I was starting over, completely over today, I would probably do mailers too. And we were just finding stuff and buying stuff so fast, it was like we didn't even need to look at them. But I would suggest that when the market's a little a little more tough like it is now, yeah, do as much outflow as you can in mailers would be a way for you to do that. And I would say the mailers that I get that are ones that catch my attention for whatever reason, and I don't know which ones that, that really do. I can't think of it now. But mailers, look, you can use them. They're fine. So the other one here I'm going to move to is brokers. Now, we love our brokers. We've gotten deals from from brokers, and it's very important that you build a relationship with these guys. I have great relationships with many brokers and you just want to get on their team to where when they find a deal, you want them to bring it to you and all of the pocket listings they get, you want them to bring it to you first. And also too, you, you want to think about with these brokers and what I try to do is that you want to make an effort to potentially add value to the brokers. What do I mean by that? Well, the brokers are so used to getting, you know, used, in, I mean, by everyone else, they're just providing value. How can you provide value back to the broker? And so I've done this by, you know, taking them out to the parks and showing them around, you know, our operations and, and what actually we're doing. I've taken them out to lunch. There's little ways that you can do that, but the brokers can offer you tons of insight into the industry. They can offer you tons of insight into what is going on in these MSAs that you're currently in. So they are super, super, super valuable if you get them on your side and you get them on your team. So you have to start networking with these guys. You have to start networking with them. And you're going to have to build up trust. Because if you've never bought a park before and you call a broker, they're not going to trust you initially. I remember... When I first started looking at deals, I'm not going to say this guy's name, but he had a listing. And look, to his defense, I'm sure he had a bunch of calls from tire kickers about it. So I get it. So there was this deal and it was on LoopNet. So he's, yeah, he definitely probably got a bunch of calls from tire kickers. And that's okay. That's okay. So I called him and I'm like, hey, you know, I got questions. I forget where the deal was about this deal. And he was just an ass. I mean, he's just like, oh yeah, what do you want to know? 
Like, what well, I'm like, oh my God. And so, look, that may happen is what I'm saying in the beginning because you haven't built up the trust, the respect, the reputation, and they don't think you're serious as of yet because they get calls from tire kickers probably frequently. And you have to be a tire kicker at some point in your career. And yes, you might be serious, but you also need to learn the questions to ask and actually how to conversate with these people so you can actually have an intelligent conversation with them because you're going to have to have some stupid conversations with them where you may look like an idiot before you actually start understanding what to say. So brokers, I cannot stress this enough. These are great people. These are industry professionals. They talk to everybody. I don't think they're appreciated enough in this business. They're sort of taken for granted, but they can provide you with tons of data and tons of insight into the business. So you definitely need to get on and start networking with these brokers. Okay, so moving on. So another option here is wholesalers. They're around. They're everywhere. And you may think they're annoying because they send you deals and they do this and they do that. But I know a bunch of wholesalers and the same thing with brokers. They're great guys. And they're actually, because you may be afraid to call, they're the ones out there with boots on the ground calling. And you're like, oh my God, I don't want to pay their fee. Well, dude, these guys are out there busting their ass to find these deals. So, so what if you pay them a 20 or 30 or $40,000 fee? If you make 4 million bucks off the deal, who cares? It's nothing. And so again, it's the same way as building a relationship with these guys, providing value to them. How I've done that is actually with someone that I would have had making calls for me. If we're not going to do the deal, I'll actually send it to a wholesaler that I have a great relationship with and give him the opportunity to put it under contract and, and assign it to someone. And that is a great way to add value to these guys. And also, a lot of these wholesalers, they want to get into the business. So if you have a park, if you have industry insights or whatever it is, you can give that to them. You can let them come onto your property and show them around. We actually, a few weeks ago, there was a uh, great guy that we're actually working with and some different facets now, but I brought him onto the property and kind of showed him around the operations and what we've done. And I enjoy doing that stuff. So it's fine with me. And it's allowed us to build up a great relationship. So I know when this guy finds deals, he's sending them to me first, for sure. And also with brokers and wholesalers, I will say this for both of them. If they send you a deal, look at it. And if you don't want it, let them know quickly because they're moving and they they appreciate that and giving feedback. If you don't want the deal, let them know why. If the price was too high, if you don't like the, you know, if it's public utilities or whatever you don't like about it, let them know that and give them some feedback. That's another way where you can provide value to these people. And we bought deals from wholesalers as, as well, too, just FYI. So again, it's relationship building in, in all facets. And really, when you're first calling a broker and a wholesaler, it's a cold call. They don't know you and you don't know them. So you got to break through that initial wall. Okay. All right. And so the last one here is email marketing. Now, I haven't done much of this. But my buddy, uh, one of the brokers I know, Armand, he's doing some email marketing, and I think he's had some success with it. So there, if you can figure out how to do this email marketing, you know, and send it to the sellers, all their AOL.com emails, <laughs> all the old school guys are still using AOL, and I didn't even know it was still a thing. So email marketing is probably a way where you can get in that people aren't really doing yet. But it's the same thing as, as mailers. Who knows? Your response rate is going to be far less than um, than on cold calling and, and things like that. So look, in conclusion here is that you need to do all of these. And, you know, as I told you before, we had never really did anything with mailers. But if I was starting over now, I would do mailers. Because, again, the more you outflow equals the more that you're going to inflow. All right. But the first one that you have to do, this is one thing that you cannot do before I close out here is that you can't do all the rest of them and not cold call. You can't not cold call owners. You can't not cold call brokers. You can't not cold call wholesalers. 
you have to do that. You have to do the cold calling part because that's the hardest one. That's the hardest one. And it's going to, it's the one that's going to do the most for you. It's going to help you build yourself. It's going to help you build your knowledge of the business. You're going to grow some balls and do it. So take action, guys. Take action. You're not going to find deals. The deals aren't going to come to you sitting on your ass on the couch. They're just not going to do it. So look, hey, guys, thank you so much again for listening to the MHP Show podcast. Please, please, please subscribe, comment, like, let me know. You can find me on social media. I'm not hard to find. I'm on every freaking social media platform at Derek Vickers 885. You can also email me at Derek at Victory Real Estate Group.com. That's Derek at Victory Real Estate Group.com. Shoot me an email with your questions, again, with topics or anything that you want to hear about. I'd love to hear from you. And we will see you next time on the MHP Show podcast. Peace. <music>